I'm going to open up some, some fairly fundamental questions to which you will, uh, will have answers, I'm sure, about where do all these ideas come from, why do some ideas spread and grow and others not, uh, is it the survival of the fittest, the cleverest, the most rational, is life fair, um, and questions of, of that kind, which I'm, I'm sure you'll be getting onto during the course of the day. Uh, it's probably very unwise for me to come to Cambridge uh, packed with very clever people to say anything about thinking, but at least I may uh, provoke you. Um, and I have had the, I guess, the advantage of having sort of worked with and got to know a lot of people in very different kinds of think tank from some of the, um, the ones, I guess, at the heart of your concern, the um, pioneers of, sort of neoliberal uh, economics and the agenda of the new right in the 80s and 90s. Uh, I got to know very well Arthur Selden, the founder of the Institute of Economic Affairs, people like Madsen Peary and others who, who did for a time become very influential, as well as very different kinds of think tank, uh, like um, Demos, Fabians, IPPR in the US, I work with Brookings and Heritage, CAS in China, uh, and many others. And this this summer happens to be the 20th anniversary of the founding of, of the, the Demos Think Tank. Uh, and in the next few weeks, there'll be it's quite an interesting set of publications and events trying to reflect on what did and didn't happen in the 20 years of its life. I'll say a little bit about think tanks within governments. Uh, I've been involved in setting up a, a number of those in, in several countries, and those are in a rather interesting place uh, at the moment. And I'll also say a little bit about very different kinds of um, do tech. So the, the, the place I was most recently working at the Young Foundation did some thinking, but much more thinking embodied in practice. Uh, and um, we used to say in a way you had a choice of either producing an idea in the form of a book or a pamphlet or a new organisation. And we focused on the latter there, and uh, I'll give one or two examples of that. From everything I've seen, there are um, some of what's most striking is the particularity of different types of think tank like the IEA or Heritage or, or Mount Pellerin Society and so on. But I'm going to try and suggest some broader patterns. And these are patterns which are answers to the meta question of how does a society think? How does a polity think? How does a government think? Governments like to think of themselves as the head of society, the brain, sort of cognitive uh, uh, helmsman. Uh, and yet, of course, they can be very, very stupid. Uh, and a lot of the analysis of government shows how poor they can be at many of the basic elements of thought, of accurate observation, analysis, uh, attention, memory, creativity, uh, and so on. And one of the things I, I'm just starting, we started the last year or two at Nesta, is actually a research program on collective intelligence tools. What can we know about the organization of these different aspects of intelligence, from, say, observation and measurement through to uh, memory? One of my uh, sort of, uh, disappointments in most of my dealings with governments is they actually have no memory. Uh, it's very rare to find in a meeting anyone who even knew what the equivalent meeting was discussing five years ago, let alone 20 years ago. Uh, and they're even poorer at creativity. So this question of, of the sort of modes of thought in, in a meta sense, I think is a, is, a, is a fascinating one of our era, and obviously critical for any university to ask itself how well situated or placed are its methods for the work of thinking and collective thought. And again, observation, analysis, creativity, memory, and so on. And I guess the challenge for all of you as well is what disciplines do you bring to bear to understand that? How much is it history? How much is it uh, you know, the economics of, of knowledge and so on? In a way, we actually lack adequate basic disciplines, I think, for understanding knowledge. But that's perhaps a, a topic for uh, a, another day. What I'm going to suggest is a, is a very crude sort of theoretical framework, at least to um, kick us off drawing 
indirectly from the work of Henry Popkin. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with his work. Um, but he, 20 or so years ago, produced a, a book which has probably been more influential outside the UK than within it on the evolution of knowledge and essentially applying a sort of Darwinian uh, framework to understanding how different types of knowledge evolve. And like any Darwinian framework, in some ways it's very, very simple. Uh, it sees the evolution of knowledge as containing three main elements. The first, as in nature, is mutation the generation of new elements, new forms, new ideas. Um, uh, <clears throat> the second is selection, the methods of selecting which of those then are, in a sense, taken on, uh, embodied in maybe political programs or government policies and so on. And then thirdly, a question of spread and replication. What are the systems whereby some ideas, like the ones you're talking about, spread? In some places, but much of the, um, uh, so the focus of your event, uh, I assume, will also be on why those ideas didn't spread at all in some other places. So I'm going to speak briefly about these three elements, mutation, selection, replication, and then a bit about the landscape of different types of think tank. So first of all, where, where, does, where does mutation come from? Where do new ideas come from? When you are working as academics, presumably you are trying to generate novelty, but often novelty within a context, within a discipline, building on others. But if you don't generate anything new, any new knowledge, you presumably don't get published, tenure, anything of that kind. And it's interesting to ask, sort of what, what are these dynamics of the creation of new types of useful knowledge? In the case of the people you're focusing on, in many ways it wasn't particularly new knowledge, it was the, re, um, uh, the reassertion of some very old ideas, some from classical economics, some from late 19th century economics, some the rediscovery of, of, of uh, Adam Smith, but slightly twisted in ways infused with a bit of uh, Hayek and, and so on into new forms. Often the key aspect of the mutation uh, element is framing, asking new types of question. So in a way the question they asked was of everything, could it be a market? Could um, uh, criminal justice be rethought as a market? So, so what is exactly what evolves? So what is the unit which you, to which your pie is starting on? Well in the case of, I'm actually going to come on to exactly that question, in Henry Popkin's uh, she writes quite a bit about that question. How, what, what is the unit of the idea? Uh, and how much are these distinct, or actually that they evolve in, in, in families or in networks of connected uh, concepts? Um, so, very good question, but, uh, but maybe if we hold that thought, I'm uh, sure we'll come on to it. Um, there definitely isn't an equivalent to the gene. I, I don't use the word mean, you might notice, <laughs> uh, so, so far in, in, in understanding it. Uh, so some of the, the, sort of the drivers of the mutation element are about, say, questions. Uh, the question simply of looking at an economy through the lens of carbon is another sort of framing question which then generates all sorts of other things. Or uh, asking questions about, um, about happiness. Uh, just last week Angela Merkel hosted a seminar in Berlin on you know, happiness and public policy. Uh, David Cameron has at least talked about that, and I remember 20 years ago coming to Cambridge to do a <coughs> seminar on happiness and public policy when only about three people were interested in that topic. Um, but these are in some ways interesting as, as questions which then generate, say, mutations, new ideas, but it's the framing which is important as much as the, uh, the ideas themselves. Generally, mutation and novelty comes most often from outsiders, from iconoclasts and radicals. And any institutions which have very strong sort of uh, pressures to conformism will, other things be equal, not be so good at that kind of creative mutation. And a lot of the ways disciplines are organized in academia, peer review, uh, and not to mention the way governments operate, are very powerful 
system, sociologically, intellectually, and economically, for driving out iconoclastic ideas and not giving much room for creativity. So it's not surprising that many of the people who you will be discussing actually didn't have a strong footing in established institutions. They were outsiders, thought of themselves as outsiders to some extent, uh, and um, deliberately tilted against the, uh, the mainstream. Another key aspect of the sort of mutation creativity stage of ideas is almost by definition they have no evidence to support them. If you have a new idea like a zero carbon economy or an entirely market based public sector, it's inconceivable you could have any evidence to prove that your idea is right. Because all evidence is about the past and all novel ideas are about the future. Uh, and um, to be effective, at this, the creative stage of idea generation, you almost need the arrogance of not being too concerned about evidence, practicality, what works, or any of these other things. The second stage in this kind of evolutionary metaphor, and I think it is more a metaphor than anything else, is what are the selection principles for ideas or families of ideas? Uh, what, what principles determine which ones spread or not? Now again, I'm sure you will have many answers to that. They include uh, political convenience, coherence, appealingness. Uh, much of the, um, the, 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 the selection space for the ideas of the, uh, the, the economic um, neoliberals of the late 20th century was created from the, the failure of the alternatives and their loss of confidence uh, and their loss of credibility. Uh, through the 70s uh, and 80s. There is also, though, a role at the second stage for evidence, for some um, reasoning about a reason. And there's a whole set of think tanks which sit much more in the second stage, the selection stage, than in the first stage. And most of the really big orthodox think tanks, like the Brookings, the Chatham House, and so on, are not places you would expect to find new ideas. They are not, by their nature, very creative. But they're very good at sifting what others have done, uh, making judgments about efficacy, making judgments about uh, what works, uh, and so on. And actually, the, the consultancies play a, a big role in that space as well. Again, you would never expect a management consultancy to come up with a new idea. I've yet to see that happen. But they're very good at sifting other people's ideas and sometimes stealing them as well, uh, and, and packaging them in a usable format for. Um, for customers. Uh, and uh, I think there's a, a, a critical role in the influence of um, the, 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 the IAs and, and Mount Pellerin and so on, was that there were a set of then sort of translation intermediary bodies who spread their ideas into practice. And around the world today, the big management consultancies are still marketing ideas from 30 or 40 years ago, which come directly from uh, this group, uh, as to some extent the bodies like the IMF uh, and World Bank. And then the replication and spread, in a sense, follows from that, from the selection, the determination of what actually works, at least works in this narrow sense of four political factions or leaderships, and then helps ideas spread. And they may be very distinct ideas, so like e-petitions, which are spreading rapidly across parliaments. Um, conditional welfare, like the Bolsa Familial, which has gone from Brazil, Mexico, New York, uh, and other places, sometimes spread in quite isolated ways, but sometimes uh, uh, as clusters of related uh, ideas. And you're more concerned here with the um, uh, the, the clustering. And again, there's, there's another set of think tanks who see their role primarily in that replication adoption uh, sense. So the OECD, which has um, a large number of very skilled teams, um, uh, again, does not see its job as being to generate ideas, but is rather to spread best practice in everything from labour market policies to educational reform to use data, use influence, use its convening power uh, to encourage the spread 
of new ideas which have been selected and proven to have some kind of, um, some kind of merit. And crudely speaking, you could say if, if this schema is, makes any sense at all of a mutation, selection, replication, the mutation stage is uh, essentially a heterodox, maverick, um, non-evidence-based. The second and third are a bit more like normal science with uh, a more incremental evolution of knowledge uh, and um, uh, prescription more informed by practice. Now in terms of the, the place of economic reason in all of this, what's very striking about the influence of the economically based think tanks from the 60s onwards was first of all how um, uh, little success they had in moving from the mutation to the selection stage. They were outsiders, they were largely ignored, they didn't have uh, influence, politicians weren't interested in them until a sudden shift in the uh, late 1970s. But equally clear is that their model of reason was a particular kind of reason, essentially deductive reason, theoretical reason from first uh, principles, uh, as opposed to empirical reason, or reason based on observation. And this was a particular sort of mode of, uh, uh, of operation which was shared in common with much of economics, but is by no means the only way of doing reason. I mean, an alternative method of doing economics is to start with observation. Uh, and, uh, and some would argue that 21st century economics needs to be much more empirical, much more evidence-based, much more experimental, much more based on observation, rather than axiomatic principles from which new ideas and new policies are deduced. Some of you will have, I'm sure, read uh, Deirdre McCloskey's work on rhetoric in economics, um, which I found very convincing in showing how many economic ideas spread not because of evidence or indeed rational argument, but the quality of the narrative structure, the stories they told. And I think a lot of the influence of the economic think tank's ideas uh, was actually the their ability to cast quite complex ideas in very common sense narrative forms, uh, whether about balanced budgets or um, uh, and debt or, or, or about opening up uh, markets. Uh, and they actually outplayed their competitors arguably more at the level of narrative simplicity and rhetoric than they did in terms of other kinds of reasons. And Albert Hirschman's work on the rhetoric of reaction um, shows this very, very clearly. Uh, and he, he showed how many of the ideas which influenced the neoliberals and neo uh, Reaganites and Thatcherites in the 80s fitted into this threefold sort of schema futility, jeopardy, and perversity. And almost every single idea was framed into one of those narratives. So the futility one being to show how the policies of the other side, whether Keynesian economics or Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, were futile, they tried to stop poverty but they simply didn't work, or jeopardy, that they, in their nature, they jeopardized something else which was valuable, often liberty, uh, and um, perversity, that in trying to perhaps um, create economic growth through nationalized industries, or as I say, solve poverty, they actually had perverse consequences which were the precise opposite of what they intended. And so I think in, you, in the frame of analysis of economic reason, one actually has to analyze in, in some detail the narrative structures of why particular ones worked and spread and captured people's attention and, and other ones uh, didn't. So what does this imply for the, the think tank uh, landscape? Well, compared to 20 or 30 years ago, uh, there are undoubtedly a lot more think tanks, certainly uh, in this country, uh, in the US, to some extent in most other um, OECD countries, though we're nothing like the same scale as um, uh, well, the US is the, the outlier. Uh, in some countries they have um, funding models really linked to academia and universities, 
In others, including this country, it's a much more varied funding uh, base, some philanthropic, some business corporate sponsorship, some indirectly um, government. In Germany, the great think tanks uh, long had essentially guaranteed funding through the parties in, in Parliament, uh, Friedrich Ebert, Stiftung, Konrad uh, Adenauer Stiftung, uh, and so on. And their role is, in some ways, uh, to do some of the things I just described, to generate ideas, to help polities think, to help select ideas which may come from other sources, including academia, but by no means exclusively uh, academia. And they've grown in part because of perception that the other institutions which might be doing thinking for polities don't work very well. Uh, political parties, at one point, had very large research departments. In the 1940s, Britain's Labour Research Department was a, a real centre of creative thought. In the 1970s, the British Conservative Party Research Department, then run by Chris Patton, was again you know, full of clever people coming up with thoughts. Uh, not many people think political parties do that today. They, run, they mainly concentrate on what to put on the advertising billboards, if they have any money at all. Similarly, there's a perception uh, that the permanent civil service is less good, uh, if it ever was particularly good, at generating ideas and policies. And only a few months ago, the current government here sort of announced a rather vague commitment to further outsourcing policy development for uh, itself. And I think the other source of um, creating space for think tanks was a perception that universities, which had played the decisive role in the generation of ideas for government from the certainly 40s to the 70s, were less able to do so. And the old model of appointing an eminent professor to run a royal commission still happens sometimes, uh, but less so. And I think there's a real paradox there to discuss what happened to universities. Universities were going through, in some ways, a dramatic expansion of their role, dramatic expansion of teaching numbers, and a continued economic boom, which is not recognized by almost any university, uh, but seen in the big picture of history, this is one of these great eras of, uh, a, a, of university um, uh, uh, wealth right across the world. But at that very time, their legitimacy as a source of ideas and creativity arguably um, declined. So what, what, what were the think tanks which filled that space? Well, there, there are a lot of different models, and I'll just quickly run through some of them. So the, the oldest one in some respects in the UK is the Fabian Society, set up in the 1880s as a membership-based think tank. And one of the interesting questions is why that model has not actually spread and been replicated. Why its political opponents didn't try and get you know, many thousands of people as paying members into a, a comparable organisation. The Fabian still survive, but they're almost unique in their organisational model. A second example, um, only a few decades later, was the creation of LSE. Now, LSE was actually founded at pretty much as a think tank, as much as as a university, with a very strong so mission, a small p, and sometimes big p political uh, mission on the 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 application of social science to solving social and uh, economic problems. Again, what's interesting is that's probably the last time in recent history that a new university has been offered as a sort of think tank model. And the LSE certainly doesn't really sustain that view of, of itself. There are very different species of think tanks um, in the world of business now. Uh, so, uh, I was a couple of weeks ago visiting Mandag Morgan in Denmark, which is arguably one of their leading think tanks, which is a bit more like Fabian in that it's based on a membership of many thousands of businesses, based on data and information and policy, but also runs programs on the environment and the future of healthcare uh, and so on. Nothing comparable in the UK, but that's a, a, an interesting sort of niche they found. The Global Business Network is another one based in the US, and it did I think one could have a base here in Cambridge, providing sort of futures thinking and reflection for big multinationals. 
In the military, there's a long tradition of different kinds of think tank, from uh, RAND Corporation to the Institute of Strategic Studies, providing a sort of arm's length um, uh, capacity for thinking about strategy and ideas on the grounds that couldn't be done within the Pentagon or a Ministry of Defense or uh, armed uh, forces. There are then many other species in the landscape. A high proportion of the ones in the UK now are all fairly similar in being quite small groups of researchers and writers primarily feeding into the political parties and Westminster and with the broadsheet media as a primary target. And those include the IEA, CPS, IPPR, uh, Demos, Social Market Foundation, lots and lots of uh, others, all in fact rather similar in their business models, quite small in scale, uh, and as I say, primarily concerned to influence relatively short-term political debate, i.e. one to two years, almost none of them really aiming at a five, 10, 20 year time horizon of the kind which in an earlier era the uh, IEA did. And what they, they have to do to do that job well is a bridging role between uh, ideas, uh, analysis and action, which you can, I think slightly caricature, sort of arbitraging, taking an idea which could be from another country or could be from a brilliant research paper by an academic and making it digestible to busy um, policy analysts, politicians uh, and so on. And it's that interpretation skill, brokering, arbitraging, is arguably one of the key ones that type of think tank uh, uh, needs. Um, and they often have to turn ideas into practical form to influence political and others advisors who are inherently suspicious of ideas, uh, and especially abstract ones, which will, are likely to be seen as unrealistic and even uh, indulgent. I, I've argued in the past that what they then need, the, sort of the, the practical question for any think tank, is three factors they have to draw on. The first is demand. Someone has to want to listen to them, uh, and that someone could be a politician or part of the civil service or, or a business or charities. They need money, uh, and there aren't that many alternative sources of money. They can be Philanthropists like your Chancellor David Sainsbury, who has funded lots of them, um, and it, or, or foundations, or occasionally academic bodies, and then they need people to attract clever, ambitious uh, people. And these three work in a, in, a, in a loop. What's interesting about many of the economic think tanks is they, at first, had very little demand, but they did have money, and they got money from particular, uh, usually entrepreneurs who were instinctively in favour of their ideas, willing to bankroll them, not too concerned about impact or evidence or anything like that over many, many decades. And they made the smart uh, decision to work closely with the universities and the economics profession and were able really to do well on mobilising talent even in the absence of demand. You could say some other think tanks have been very strong on demand and strong on money, but rather weak on people. But anyway, that's a, it's a kind of a, an analytical framework one can use for both judging and criticizing uh, the way different uh, think tanks work. The main reason there are a lot of them around in the UK is, I think, primarily uh, economic. Simply, there is quite a lot of free money around from um, global business budgets, philanthropists, foundations willing to support quite a lot of think tanks um, in, in operation. And you see this most clearly uh, if you're in you're other countries, I'm quite often asked by people in other countries to advise when they're trying to set up a think tank, and in most countries there aren't those conditions. There simply isn't the money, uh, in the sense of the untied money for funding ideas, and that makes it very difficult because without that economic base you can't actually do much um, thought. Uh, and the one other thing I've mentioned just in the current landscape is the international exchange. So the Mount Pelerin Society, Mont Pelerin Society, which uh, you'll be talking about I'm sure later today, was a deliberate attempt at creating a global network of 
neoliberals, Hayekians, and so on back in the late 1940s, which eventually did uh, pay off. Um, uh, there have been various other networks over the years, from the Comintern to the Socialist International, and in the, um, the 90s and 2000s, the Progressive Governance Network, which at one point I had to help run, and run summits of, which gathered political leaders like um, Blair, Clinton, Becky, Schroeder, Lula, together to, to share ideas, and, and, and now has a, a continuing form in the policy network uh, organization. Um, arguably, there's still a bit of a sort of gap there, and it's not quite clear what organizational forms will really work on that, that global linking of political groups, but it's an interesting space to watch. I'm going to spend just five minutes now on, on think tanks within government. Um, there have always been, or not always, but often been groups uh, dedicated to thought within government, sometimes just cabal to advisors around a president or prime minister. The Foreign Office in the UK has a policy planning staff who are the in-house think tank, often with very clever people. In the 1970s, Ted Heath set up the Central Policy Review Staff in the Cabinet Office, which was called the Think Tank, uh, to generate uh, ideas. And one of my jobs when I came into government um, here in the UK was to think what, what, what would have been learned from those different experiences and to see uh, if we could generate uh, models which combined the best of what they did but also avoided some of their pitfalls. And in a nutshell, we concluded that their common weakness was that they combined very clever people and wrote very brilliant papers, but didn't actually have much impact on anything. And so we tried to design a different model initially with a thing called the Social Exclusion Unit, which um, was a, a unit created half with civil servants and half with people seconded in from outside government, from charities and academia and so on but which worked in a much more um, project-based and problem-solving approach with ministers and senior civil servants sort of locked into the working process so that um, by the time they reached their conclusions, uh, we had pretty much worked out how things would be implemented, who would implement them, what the budget would be, what the legislation would be. Whereas the CPRS model was to work for a year and then produce an essay and that essay was then sort of thrown into cabinet where it was usually, or sometimes, just rejected because it, it hadn't been embedded into the underlying machineries and processes. That method was then adapted for the um, strategy unit, which lasted until about a year, year and a half ago, and I think will be probably reinvented in the fairly near future. And it's, it's a model which has been partly replicated in some other countries. So Kevin Rudd, who just became Prime Minister again in Australia yesterday, uh, he set up, a, a, and I helped work on it, a, a strategy unit when he came to power. France uh, set up a Centre d'Analyse Stratégique, and there are similar-ish teams in, um, there was one in Brussels for the European Commission, uh, in um, countries like Singapore, uh, and very different ones in countries like China, which has both uh, a much more academic variant of think tank in CAS, but also a series of think tank capacities around the State Council uh, and um, uh, in, in the RC, whatever it's called. Um, at the moment, we're just halfway through a, a, a sort of research study on not quite these strategy teams in governments, but a new generation of units which are spreading governments, which we're calling I-teams. And this is a sort of very important sort of I think, shift in, uh, in the evolution, um, which is a shift to thinking about uh, the development of new ideas not so much as a paper-based exercise of policy design, but often about new ideas embodied in practice, and often coming from practice rather than from theory. A good example in, in the UK, uh, run by a Cambridge man, uh, David Halpern, is a behavioural insights team based in number 10, which has drawn on some of the theories of behavioural economics, but instead of producing papers telling departments what policies to do, it runs real life experiments in job centres or with uh, letters sent to people for collecting tax. 
So it's essentially a, a, a do tag at the heart of government. We're looking at what we call I teams, these innovation teams in governments around the world, uh, from organisations like MindLab in, in Denmark, Citra in Finland, uh, a series of them set up by uh, Mayor Bloomberg in cities uh, across the US, Permandu in Malaysia, uh, and, and various others. And what's interesting about all of them is they have a quite different sort of cognitive model of generation of ideas, selection, replication from the traditional paper-based think tanks of the late 20th century, the kind of economic uh, think tanks whose essential, say, medium was reading paper and uh, producing paper. Uh, and the main output of these new generation of think tanks, as I say, is practice, and often much faster learning from practice. Now, in a sense, that's what I tried to do in the, the Young Foundation over the last 10 years, drawing on the, the legacy of Michael Young, uh, some of whose legacy is just down the road in Cambridge at the Michael, Michael Young Centre. Uh, for those of you who don't know his history, he was um, a think tanker in the 1930s in the Policy and Review ERP, what it stands for, and then wrote Labour's 1945 manifesto, and did spend much of his life doing the sort of top-down classic think tank policy design, but by the mid-50s had become convinced that actually much more social creativity would come from doing things. And he set up uh, in East London, became a social entrepreneur, created things like the Open University, which, and literally uh, made about 100 organisations to embody new ideas. Uh, and uh, in 2000. And Four, five, we relaunched his, his entities as the Young Foundation, very much to do the same, to create an incubator of new organisations. And I'll just give one example of, of many dozens which, which have come out of it uh, in the last few years, and that's the Studio School, um, where in, so in the middle of the last decade we did quite a lot of work on why education policy was still failing so many teenagers, why so many were either being truant or excluded from school or leaving without qualifications. And as I said at the beginning, we could have published a book. We could have published a pamphlet telling government to fix this problem in new ways. Instead, we tried to design a new kind of school which would address those problems. We called it the studio school. We, in classic mutation mode, um, shamelessly plagiarised lots of ideas from around the world from existing schools and came up with a model in which most of the curriculum is done through practical projects and you learn your English, your science, your math through real life projects. Some of the, some of the curriculum involves paid work, it's mainly working in teams, non-cognitive skills central to its operation and so on. But the key point is we move quickly to testing it in real places Luton and Blackpool, uh, and then set up a first set of schools now three years ago. Um, and because essentially it worked, the children got much better GCSE results, were much more motivated, that then created a momentum to spread schools. So there will be 45 schools open by next September. And in the spending review on Wednesday, George Osborne announced funding for another 20 schools on top of that. So this is an idea which will spread fairly fast. It embodies a very radical rethink of how education should work, dramatically different, in fact, from most existing schools. It essentially works, but I suspect nothing would have happened if we published a pamphlet. Uh, and we only persuaded a rather sceptical government of ministers by showing it in practice and in reality. So that's the other model of sort of do tank uh, of thinking in, in, embedded in practice. I'm just going to make two or three sort of final points and then let's open up for the discussion. The reason we've been working on these I teams and these new methods of generating ideas and involving users in service design and so on around the world is partly to improve the mutation part of what I was describing. So the creativity to come up with new methods of healthcare or welfare or education. But I'm as concerned with the selection stage, uh, that in principle is not particularly healthy for any society if, if ideas are mainly selected by their narrative structure rather than by whether they actually work. 
So over the last year or so at Nesta, we've, we've created a thing called the Alliance for Useful Evidence, which tried to bring together the people working on the generation of evidence in all these fields, from education to childcare to welfare, and the users of evidence in national government, local government, the professions. There's now well over a thousand people and organisations in it. The website is, is worth looking at. We run events all over the country, bringing together these different groups to talk about what counts as evidence, how to use data, how to evaluate, how to use randomised tools, uh, etc. We advocated to government that they should create a series of centres to act as intermediaries on evidence. Uh, and in February, the government announced six What Works centres to become brokers of uh, evidence. Um, uh, in some ways, a very unwise thing for them to do because almost inevitably these centres will say some of their most cherished policies don't work uh, and these will be independent so they can't stop them. Um, and, uh, and we've started launching new evidence tools. So uh, just over a week ago, we launched a thing called Randomize Me with Ben Goldacre, which is a do-it-yourself tool for randomized control trials uh, to bring down the cost of those. But mainly, in fact, just to raise awareness of how do you generate evidence? How do you find if something works or not? And as I said earlier, one of my complaints about the think tank tradition you're focusing on today is it was surprisingly uninterested in evidence. It was essentially a theoretical deductive uh, approach to the world. And uh, one of my jobs in government at one point was reviewing the private finance initiative history, PPPs, which had spread all over the world, had made huge sums of money for many institutions, but what was really striking is it had been introduced with no design to allow any evidence to be gathered on whether it worked or not. And when we then did do a review of whether most of the PFIs made economic sense, whether they worked in terms of economic reason, it was pretty clear the majority didn't. The majority had been bad value for money. Uh, I was then phoned by the then Deputy Prime Minister and the Chancellor, demanding that any um, of this analysis be suppressed uh, and not reach the public because it was too threatening. Um, can I quote you on that? You certainly can. Yeah. Uh, it did, uh, fortunately, they did then change the policies and they became a bit more um, sensible. But the key point here was a set of ideas were introduced on a large scale with no evidence, no evaluation, no scrutiny to disproof, to verification. And the same was true of most of the policies which came out of the, the neoliberal think tanks. And I think the generation of tougher scrutiny of evidence more open evidence is a crucial part of so we're social cognition, helping a polity to think. It has to go alongside much more creativity, because if you only have evidence, you don't have creativity and mutation, you end up with stagnation. Uh, but if you can attempt to do both, you get a more optimal uh, result. Just two final points. One is about the, the thesis, which is um, actually written in the introductory paragraph for, for today. Uh, a thesis which said the role of intellectuals as individuals may have declined relative to think tanks. I'm actually rather sceptical about that as an account of what has happened. Uh, and indeed, if anything, I think one could argue that we're in a period when the individual intellectual is becoming more powerful uh, relative to institutions, and those institutions may be universities or departments or think tanks. You can see that in many of the fields which are having most influence on policy at the moment. So I mentioned behavioural economics, pioneered by people like uh, Danny Kahneman, subject of a Demos collection in 1996, I should say, uh, and now part of a um, as a government unit in the Behavioural Insights team. But that's a field which has been driven much more by individual intellectuals like Kahneman, Cass Sunstein and others, Richard Thaler, than it has by think tanks. Um, look at the continued visibility of the big intellectuals like Manuel Castell or Roberto Unger, but also more recent ones like David Graeber, uh, whose work has influenced the Occupy movement and whose work on debt I think is one of the most interesting intellectual contributions of recent years. 
In the age of social media and the internet, individuals can quickly get very, very large followings, wholly separate from any intermediate institutions, whether universities or think tanks. Uh, and um, it, it seems highly likely that will become even more the case that you will find some thinkers with followings of hundreds of thousands or many millions, uh, really, but, but not dependent on any institutional home. This is true also in China, where on Weibo, most <coughs> particular thinkers with many millions of, um, of followers. A very interesting experiment to support that is this launching at the moment in the UK, the launch of the conversation, which is an Australian model, um, where in Australia it's funded by all of the universities to provide a platform for academics to communicate to the wider public, helped by an editorial team of journalists. And what's been striking in Australia, in the just since 18 months it's been going, is individual academics, often in quite junior positions, through the conversation, getting followings of hundreds of thousands of people, and becoming, in some ways, public intellectuals much faster than would have been the case a generation or two ago. So, I would slightly question the thesis. A final point is really a question of, so where, where does all this go um, next? In the spirit of the sort of evolutionary framework which I suggested for thinking about think text and thinking, mutation, selection, replication, of course I shouldn't offer any forecast at all, because it's unpredictable which kinds of institution or people or clusters of ideas will actually be able to spread and what, which ones won't. In a competitive landscape, which pits different kinds of think tanks against different universities, against consultancies, and against lone intellectuals with massive social media followings. The only comment I would make, uh, partly prompted by having observed a Think Tank of the Year awards a couple of days ago, is I think actually our real problem is, um, is one which wasn't mentioned at all there, which is uh, an excess of orthodoxy. Uh, I published a, a, a book a few months ago for Princeton University Press, part of which looks at the ways in which past economic crises have generated new solutions. And certainly after 1929, what was very striking is how for quite a few years, most governments around the world essentially tried orthodox solutions. And it was only when the orthodox solutions had been tried again and again and failed that then a lot of space grew up intellectually, politically, and in other respects for new ideas. I think we are still in a phase like the early 30s, not the late 30s in that respect, where the orthodox solutions are being tried ever more intensively and with not, not much effect. And, and partly because of the funding models of many of the current think tanks, they have a bias towards orthodoxes of different kinds, and at exactly the time when we need much more radical iconoclastic uh, thinking. Uh, and the longer the crisis goes on, the more we will need that kind of truly creative and challenging thinking. And at the moment, that's where the most visible deficit is. So, um, I haven't gone on too long. I hope that's at least a few thoughts on thinking for you all to violently disagree with. <laughs>